Good. So as Harold pointed out, so I would like to crystallize a little bit these differences and we categorize them in four dimensions. And I will walk through these four dimensions a little bit more precisely. And these four dimensions actually came already up in the master negotiations. So that's not something new. So uh, one part of the book is dealing with what we call the Maastricht's ghost. It's something which was already apparent in the Maastricht negotiations in the early 90s when you know, the EMU was uh, essentially negotiated about. And then we have a second part of the book which is on essentially what we call uh, the Maastricht stepchild. That's the things which were overlooked during the Maastricht negotiations, something which only became apparent afterwards that this actually will create problems in the Eurozone. So the first thing, as Harold pointed out, is this discretion versus rules. The second thing is solidarity, French solidarity versus the German liability principle. The third thing is I would like to talk about is liquidity versus solvency. From if there's some financial problem from a French perspective, it's always a liquidity problem. From a German perspective, it's a solvency problem. And finally, there's a lot of debate. Of course, everybody reads in the newspaper about Keynesian stimulus versus austerity and reform measures. But let me move to this discretion versus rule. So essentially, the French perspective is very much an active management. Let's solve the current crisis. While the Germans are very much afraid, if you very actively solve the current crisis, you actually create essentially a future crisis. And you know, there's a trade-off. So you have to be very aware of this. And if the French, when they do very actively and you talk to the Germans, they say, oh, this ad hoc measures, constantly some ad hoc measures to fix this, to fix that. You need a rule, a whole framework of rules which actually deal with the whole thing. That's the way uh, the Germans are thinking. But once you think a little bit more deeply about it, it's actually not so simple about discretion versus rules. Actually, the French approach is much more that in certain dimensions, you really commit very powerful. So you have some straight checker commitments, but that requires in other dimensions to be very active in management. Okay? While the German is much more as an autonomous safety valves or escape valves system where you know, there's in the same safety well of some flexible exchange rate or whatever you have, which are just automatically without government intervention. While, you know, from a French perspective, in certain dimensions, you really, you know, strictly check this. And some classic examples of this, where you really commit the future, you commit today to some very strict rules in order to fix the current crisis, is, for example, not to default. And so the French are very, very strong or not defaulting, more strong than the Germans. So the, the rationale, of course, is if you commit not to default, your current interest rate will be lower, and hence you might have a chance to get out of it, out of the crisis, because you don't pay such a high interest rate. From a German perspective, there's some debt restructuring is uh, possible. And the classic example, as Harold mentioned, was Deauville, when Chancellor Merkel and uh, the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, walked on the beach and agreed on this debt restructuring for, uh, for Greece uh, without involving anybody else. Essentially, it was decided um, by the two nations uh, what will happen in Greece. Another example is uh, the currency pack. So the French are very much, if you look at the international currency arrangement, their favorite model is a lot of fixed currency packs, very limited uh, currency movements. Or similarly, if you go into a currency union, you really make it impossible to exit. So in the Maastricht Treaty, the French imposed that there will be no uh, provision for any exit, okay? because the exit should be so strong and so, uh, so uh, expensive that nobody ever even dreams to exit, so ex because otherwise you open yourself up against speculative attacks. So the philosophy was you really commit very strongly to this. So in, in contrast to the currency peg, the Germans were always pushing very much for flexible exchange rates. Okay? So on the one hand, if you have the currency peg, you have to manage your capital flows across borders very actively in order to make sure the currency peg is always holding. Germans are much more for floating exchange rates and then you can have free capital flows. In the international finance literature, there's this famous trilemma and you can see that you can actually only pick two of these three uh, possibilities. You can have a fixed exchange rate, so no exchange at volatility. You can have free capital flows, or you can have your own autonomous monetary policy. You can pick one, uh, two of the three. And what the French pick, they pick essentially these two components, where the Germans pick these two components. In this triangle, they take very different positions. 
Okay, so the philosophy is very different. On the one hand, you know, you commit very strongly to something. It gives you an advantage if you commit very strongly to something, but it forces you to actively manage on some other dimensions. While from a, a German perspective, it's much more, you want to have everything more flexible, so it doesn't require so much government intervention uh, later on. And of course, as everybody, every student knows, so I probably just uh, repeat what you know anyway, if you have this discretion approach, in particular in certain dimensions, you have this time inconsistency problem, what you do ex ante, what you would like to commit to, is not optimal what's exposed, so you have a commitment problem there. Equally important and emphasized by the Germans, you're always subject to political pressures, to political economy problems. You must have you know, exposed, you might want to favor one industry over another industry and all this. Um, you have this problem. On the other hand, if you have a very rule system, you often have unforeseen contingencies and you don't know to include how to include this in rules because you don't know what will happen and the rule cannot be fine-tuned to include things you haven't foreseen beforehand. So that's this rules versus discretion debate. The other thing is we talked already about the solidarity versus liability principle. If you look at what happened whenever there was some debate about fiscal union that you know we have <coughs> joint liabilities and all that or any you know helping the Greece in you know providing some subsidies and so forth it went through the French parliament without any in a second or anything went through immediately without without <coughs> much debate in Germany in the German parliaments there were huge debates and everything was essentially delayed because the German way of thinking is very much a liability principle which says the guy who is in charge has to be liable for it. So you take the, the upside, you also take the downside. So you have to be in charge so the control, whoever, whoever has the control is also liable for any losses. And that's very strongly uh, pronounced uh, in German economic thinking uh, and that shows you know, in the fiscal union debate so the Germans, if you could move the control to Brussels, then they would say, fine, then we can also have some joint liability. But as long as the control, how much you know, spend and the government spending is in the national capitals, there won't be any joint liability. And this, of course, uh, fed into the Eurobond discussion. There was a big debate, you know, should we have Eurobond with joint liabilities? On the Germans, essentially, Angela Merkel said, not in, when, as long as she said, not in my lifetime. So not even you know, after she is not in power anymore, she said, not in my lifetime, there will be euro bonds with joint liability. The, th the next dimension is essentially liquidity versus uh, solvency, and I just mentioned here again what Harold said. So whenever there's a financial problem, you never really know 100% whether it's a liquidity problem or a solvency problem. Is it really so fundamental that whenever you put the money in, you throw good money off the bad? Or is it really you just show that you put some money in and then everything will be resolved? And there are different types of liquidity problems. The first one is a multiple equilibrium story. And that's here I've drawn a little bit a, a su supply curve, a vertical, and then a demand curve. And you have essentially two stable equilibria, one equilibrium here and another equilibrium here. And if you're in the bad equilibrium, you just show the big bazooka and then actually everything will jump from the bad equilibrium to the good equilibrium. The term big bazooka came actually out of the UK because in this side, the UK is always similar to the French. Said, oh, just show a big bazooka, um, uh, which was translated into German in some different language. Um, and that will be enough to really help out and solve all the problems. Okay? And the Germans don't believe in this story at all. You can, so, and a classic example essentially is uh, the Draghi speech in in the summer of 2012, when all the yields were exploding, so here the Greek, the Portuguese, all the yields are way above 10%, and uh, the other yields were very, very high compared to the German Bund. And Draghi essentially said, I do whatever it takes to bring this down. So we do, and he introduced this OMT program. First he said, I do whatever it takes. Nobody really knew what it is. It was very vague. And then he made the speech in July. And then in September, it was clear there was this OMT program. And they never spent a single euro. Okay? But the whole thing, the whole yields came down. Okay? From a German perspective, oh, the ECB just provided some guarantees. That's why the yields came down. But you know, it points to it that there was a huge liquidity problem, just showing whatever it takes 
was essentially enough to bring yields down. Of course, later they introduced QE and all this, and QE sucked up uh, a lot of these bonds. Now, this is a multiple equilibrium story. Of course, you can also have liquidity problems if you say, you know, I only have to put in one euro or one dollar, and then I get 10 uh, euros as benefit. No, then you say that's actually some good investment. So if your strategic complementarities are not so pronounced that this the demand curve looks like an inverted S shape, but this is more like this, then any new shock, if you change any shock which moves the demand curve around, the price jumps around a lot. So it's <laughs> instead of multiplicity, it's, it's amplification. So amplification means a small shock leads to a huge change in prices. Multiplicity means no shock can lead to a huge change of prices because you have multiple equilibria. Okay? So it's less extreme than this. But even here you might say, yeah, why should we should if the expected net present value of a bailout is positive, then we should do it, no? Because we just put one euro in and we get ten euros out. Um, what is the expected net present value of a bailout? It's the present value of a bailout minus the present value of no bailout. And that's where the difference in views come in play as well. Because the French perspective is if it don't bail out, it will just destroy everything. The contagion effect, the spillover effects are tremendous. Well, the Germans say, ah, oh, come on, don't play up this contagion effect. They're not so big. And this really played out in the sp uh, spring of 2013 when the Cyprus banks got into difficulties. So during that time, it was the case that you know, all the Russian oligarchs who put all demand deposits in Cyprian, Cyprian banks, there was this big debate between France and Germany. Should we bail out um, the, the, the Cyprian banks? And I still remember some official telling me, saying, okay, if Cyprus is systemic, then everything is systemic, and we have to bail out everything all the time. And um, at the end, the Germans won on this dimension, and uh, there was essentially a bail-in organized. And this actually changed to a radical shift. So if you, until Cyprus, there was a huge bailout, even in Germany, bailed out a lot of the banks. But from then onwards, it moved to a bail-in regime. You know, even the head of the Ecofin group, he said, oh, now Cyprus is a template for all the other potential problems. We will always, always bail in. And that's essentially what happened uh, uh, with the Cyprus event. And you can see how the battle was going back and forth between these uh, two nations. Now, finally, there's this Keynesian stimulus demand and austerity and reform efforts. And of course, there's very much a different way of thinking. The, the French and the Anglo-American way of thinking is very similar here, is to have this output gap and you know, it drops off or you want to come back to your old uh, steady state. But typically, you want to do structural reforms in booms. So in our models, even if you had a zero lower bound, doing productivity enhancing structural reforms is actually counterproductive. Okay? So in these models, they, you would not, not even want to do them. So the, the emphasis here, typically it's much easier in booms. There are some winners. You take a little bit of this way, and you can reshuffle some gains, and you can push some reforms through. Now, the German way of viewing is very much, you know, there are some unsustainable credit booms going on from time to time, and this has to come down to some extent because it was unsustainable. And more importantly, when should you do the reforms? They might agree, yes, it would be better to do the reforms in good times, but you can't do them. You can only do it when the TINA principle holds. The TINA principle means there is no alternative. When you really stand against the wall and everything is tough, then you say, okay, now I can politically push through some, poli uh, some reforms. And that was the case for Germany in the 2000s. Germany was the sick man of Europe. That's when you could push it through. And you can document very precisely how the government tried everything to avoid it and get some relaxation to make more debt and all this. But, you know, it was just some people were fighting it. And at that time, they were essentially forced to push some reforms through. And it, then it paid off later on. And you have similar experiences in the 1950s and so forth. And Germany is essentially saying, yes, we did it. And the others have to do it too. Okay, that worked, and it is uh, the way to go forward. But essentially, the, the difference in philosophy is very much how much you emphasize the political economy problems relative to non-political economy problems, where you just say, oh, one is the most opportune to do it, but then you still cannot do it because everybody is uh, 
blocking the political process. So these were essentially these four dimensions. That's what we say. These are things which were known um, already during the domestic negotiations. Perhaps the contagion effects. That's something which was not <coughs> so uh, well appreciated. But what we then say in the second part of the book, and I will just give a very glance, otherwise you won't buy the book, uh, uh, is the financial stability. So you might say, why was financial stability ignored? It was always said, as long as you have no inflation, everything will be fine, the, the banking will be safe, and you just have to focus on, on low inflation. The first thing was, when the Maastricht Treaty was negotiated, which you know, established the European Monetary Union, the banking system was way, way smaller. Okay? Mm -hmm. The banking system really grew, and in particular in Europe it grew, and many of the European banks became global banks raising funds even from the US and distributing them globally. So the European banks became really big players. And a lot of this funding shifted. So from traditional banks where you get demand deposits, a lot of this funding became wholesale funding. What does it, why does it make a difference? Demand deposits is you and me depositing some in the checking account and some savings account. We don't really follow every day what's going on and it's very sluggish. So it's very, it's essentially, even though you can withdraw it overnight, it is fairly sluggish. Wholesale funding is managed by some money market fund manager. If something goes wrong and if there's a run, they run way faster. So it's much less stable. Okay, so that's a one change. The other thing is when the Maastricht negotiations were held in the early 90s, this was before the Southeast Asia crisis. And the spillover effects, that's only what we learned really from the Southeast Asia crisis. There's huge spillover effects, liquidity spirals, fire cells, and systemic risk. This really happened in the Southeast Asia crisis. So it was not in the policymakers who were negotiating these treaties in their uh, foremind that they're actually worried about. The other thing is, you know, on the asset side of the banks, you have all the spillover effects. So assets lose through the liquidity spiral, they lose value, fire sales, and all this. But on the liability side of banks, you have this disinflation or deflation phenomena, which increases the value of the liabilities. Now, that's also bad if suddenly your debt increases in real value. So this inflationary spiral, this essentially only became more prominent through the Japan, which happened already in the early 90s, but it was not so digested when the Maastricht negoci negotiation happened. So the fact that the money multipliers can collapse, that you can st be stuck in a, a low inflation environment, which hurts the guys with a lot of debt, including the banks and the financial sectors, and there's not enough lending, and if there's lending, it goes on to zombie banks, uh, the zombie firms, or it's done by zombie banks, and it distorts the lending very much. That's something which was not appreciated um, at that time. Now, let me just say, this essentially you might say, oh, that's nothing new. That's something which would happen in a single country too. No? There's, what's the connection to a monetary union on this? You know, spillovers can hap happen within a country. This inflation, like in Japan, it happened too. No? That's, it's not really particular to a, a monetary union. There were two aspects which are more for a currency union relevant. And again, I should say, let me make an aside briefly. The US was essentially, most US economists were against the European Monetary Union, or the Euro, because they followed the, the optimal currency area, a la Mandel. And, and then they said, oh, when it went sour, oh, I told you so, because you didn't follow the optimal currency union literature. But if you look at the optimal currency union literature, or currency area literature, it has says n almost nothing about banks. There are no banks in it. And the reason why the things went sour is primarily of this bank finance financial problems rather than uh, you know, lack of labor mobility or other things. You might even argue it's actually bad that all the productive young guys out of Italy move out of Italy and leave the Italian debt behind. They walk away from the Italian debt. Anyway, so in the currency union, so what's different in the currency union is essentially that if you have euro denominated debt, or let me put it differently, if you're a country and you control your own currency, then your banks have, and your sovereign has certain debt in your own currency, then you can actually, through the, if there are problems, if there's a liquidity problem, you can actually expand uh, by printing more money. If you have if you're in a currency union and your monetary 
authority is in Frankfurt and you're Spain or Italy or something, you have no control over that. So you can't just print money. So it's essentially like euro denominated debt is almost like a foreign denominated currency debt. Okay? So that's subject to default risk. So even if there's a liquidity problem, you're subject to default risk. And that's also what people argue happened you know, before the London speech. That there was sub the credit risk ripped up because liquidity problems might have morphed into uh, solvency problems. Then the second thing is there's this famous uh, diabolic or doom loop between sovereign, bank sovereign debt and banking debt. And there are actually two uh, doom loops. So for example, if suddenly this default risk is going up, so the sovereign debt risk is going up, because banks in Europe hold a lot of the sovereign debt, the assets lose in value, and hence the equity loses in value. So the, the probability of a bailout is actually going up, which essentially undermines the financial position of the, of the government again. And that's essentially one of these famous doom loops or diabolic loops, you know, making things, causing a huge positive correlation between the sovereign yields or yield spreads and banking yields. On top of it, and I think that's even more important, is that the banks essentially hold a lot of the sovereign debt and they're losing value, the equity goes down, and because of that they want to delever and they essentially lend less to the real economy. This brings the real economic growth rate down and with it the tax revenue, which again hurts the sovereign, okay, hurts the government. And that's another doom loop or diabolic loop. Okay, so that's essentially what's going on in, in the currency union, much more so because you cannot simply control uh, by, you know, the default risk is creeping in and it makes it more dramatic. Now the other problem is that in the currency union, you want to have a safe asset. The banks have to park, if they raise, let's say, some equity, they have to park their funds in, in some safe asset. And the only safe asset because of this default risk and Germany didn't have much of a default risk, was essentially provided by the core, especially by the German sovereign. Okay. So the German Bund, that's the government debt of Germany, was essentially the safe asset for Europe. So what does this mean? Whenever the crisis became more severe, everybody was rushing out of the peripheral countries and wanted to buy the safe asset uh, of uh, Germany, the German Bund. Okay, so what you had is that whenever the crisis became more severe, the German Bund appreciated and the other sovereign yields actually went up because the underlying bonds depreciated. Okay. So these are two uh, things. And the question is, how do you fix that? Okay. How do you make sure that all of these assets are safe assets and you, know, you have a European-wide safe asset? The problem is typically always if the safe asset is not provided by a European wide. It's also, you know, in the world, it's essentially the US Treasury and the German Bund and Japanese yen, which are the safe assets. And that's, you know, there will be flight to safety into the, in the US as well. It's similar here. It's a very asymmetric provision of safe assets here within a currency union. Now, so there are two ways out. Okay, there's a French way and there's a German way. So the French way is to say, yeah, we never default, okay? So all these countries will never default, so all the sovereign debt is safe, okay? And how do we do that? So we have to commit not to default. We have to do a straight check commitment again. How do you do it? You just take your banks as a hostage. So how do you, so you say, if we were to default, the whole banking system would go down because of this diabolic loop. This would ruin our whole country and our whole economy. So at the end of the day, believe us, we will never default. Okay? That's like the, the, the hostage pers perspective. So the French view is you almost never default. to you use your banks as a hostage. And, but if it really has a, you have another huge adverse shock, then you're really in trouble because you drag not only your sovereign down, you drag down your banking system and the economy is really going down. Now the German view is different and said, okay, oh no, if the banks, if they have this diabolic loop and all this, the banks have to have an extra safety buffer. So we have to put some <coughs> risk weights. Uh, you know, the banks should be an insurance if the sovereign needs to be restructured and the banks hold some of the sovereign, the bank should have enough equity cushion to allow for this restructuring. 
Okay? So that's another safety valve, essentially, if you want. So the banks are essentially insurance against sovereign default. And the whole idea was you don't have an exchange rate anymore as a safety valve, but you might want to have restructuring government debt you know, as a, another safety valve. Now, if you come to this, then there's this huge, at the moment, there's this huge bargaining or this huge um, debate going on whether you put risk weights on sovereign debt or not. What does it mean, put risk weights on it? Uh, essentially, there's a Basel agreement which says how much equity buffer banks have to put aside if they hold sovereign debt. And, you know, if you go on this perspective, French perspective, no government will ever default, then you don't need any risk weights. That's the current regulation. The Germans, of course, pushing hard, uh, saying, yeah, we need risk weights because Italian, Spanish bonds, they're all very risky. So if the Spanish banks want to hold some Spanish sovereign, they have to put some risk weights on it. Of course, the others say, yeah, you only do this because then you force your banks to hold the German bond because there's no risk weight on the German bond. Okay. So the argument, let's go back to the French view, is essentially if there's the default probability is lower, the interest rate will be lower, and you have, by you committing never to default, you can have a, a lower interest rate, and you might grow out of the whole problem because your funding costs will be lower. Okay? But of course, this ignores this second diabolic loop I mentioned earlier. If there is a problem, you can't sell your sovereign bonds anymore, but you stuff it into your banks. Okay? The banks will not have so many funds to really lend to the real economy. They will actually lend to the government. And hence, there is, because they give fewer loans to the real economy, the economic growth will go down, tax re revenue will go down, and that actually makes the whole thing more risky as well. So th this whole argument is, is not hanging fully together. Now, is there a way to square the circle? Is there a way where I can say, I would like to have a safety valve, which is occasionally in extreme circumstances to restructure government debt, but on the other hand, I would also like to have a safe asset which is not only provided by Germany, but is European Union-wide or Euro area-wide. Okay, how can I square this circle? On the one hand, I want a safe asset, which is not subject to default. On the other hand, I want restructuring, which means there is some default. Okay, how can I do that? And that's essentially two challenges is to say, okay, I want a safe asset, like a la the French view, but I want some sovereign debt restructuring without this diabolic loop a la this Anglo-American, so the Anglo-American view, the IMF view, is very much, you know, you allow occasional debt restructuring. And the second challenge is essentially you don't want to have that the, the safe asset is only provided by a subset of countries. And that's uh, some years back, uh, uh, your group, Euronomics group I put together, in 2011 we proposed the so-called SPs. Okay? SP stands for European Safe Bonds. And at that time, it was competing with many other different bond proposals, but now I think our proposal is coming back. It got a second win. So again, the idea is essentially you want to actually redirect this cross-border capital flows to some other direction which are not across borders. And here's the idea. And you also don't want to create joint liability. So a euro bond where we say all the bonds, Germany is liable for all the bonds all the other countries that do, will also do the trick, but Germany doesn't want this joint liability. They have this liability principle. So here, let's uh, use some uh, securitization. So the idea is the following. You pool all the 19 euro area sovereign bonds up to 60% of GDP. So you have a pool of sovereign debt. And then you issue a senior bond and a junior bond. Okay. Senior bond is 70%, the junior bond is 30% of the pool. Now, if there's a default, some one country were to default, then of course the asset side of this vehicle will suffer, but it will be first eating into the junior bond. And the senior bond is protected by the junior bond. Okay. So the senior bond is fairly safe. We did a lot of simulations on that. And there's a huge analysis behind that. Essentially, you can show as long as France is not defaulting and the recovery rates are reasonable, um, it, the senior bond is never touched. Okay? The senior bond is really safe and it is European. It's not German. And the junior bond is also European. Okay? Of course, the senior bond will not yield much of an interest rate because it's very safe, but the all of the interest rate which you make on these sovereign bonds will be attributed to the junior bond primarily. <coughs> 
Now what happens then if there is a, a shock? Now instead of having this cross-border capital flows, you have capital flows from the junior bond to the senior bond, but they're both European. Okay, it doesn't flow across borders anymore. Okay, that's essentially the idea. If you want more on this, we have a website uh, where we have now all the details worked out. And there's actually a high-level special task for us set up to look at the implementation of that. So let me conclude to leave a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I mentioned already discretions versus rules, which has, you know, the straight check a commitment you have to, it's not so simple discussion versus rules, there's a straight check a commitment component in the French perspective, which we think a compromise would be the ESPs. There are a lot of other things which we mentioned in the book you could do in along these four principles to really solve things and make the world better. One particular one is, you know, emphasizing firewalls and what we want to trigger is this race away from the bottom. So the idea is essentially you always let the, the worst performer fail. So you don't bail out the worst performer, but you protect the rest. Okay? So nobody wants to be the worst performer. And this competition among the different entities, not to be the worst guy, leads to a race away from the bottom. Nobody wants to be at the bottom. And this actually makes the whole system more stable. So that's essentially um, one of the elements we, we put in the book and many other things more. So let me stop here because I spent already more time than I planned and uh, we open up the questions. <coughs>